The Israelite king Solomon, son of David, has gone on to fame for his wisdom, his world weariness in the book of Ecclesiastes, his lechery and apostasy, and of course his power as a mage, especially his control over demonic spirits. From the Dead Sea Scrolls to the contemporary occult practices of Solomonic magic, this Israelite king has figured centrally in the history of magic alongside such luminary figures as Zoroaster, Pythagoras, and Hermes Trismegistus. Most famous for his magical seal ring, Solomon is legendarily said to have controlled and bound an entire host of demons in the construction of the Jerusalem temple. But what is our earliest attestation of this legend? Just how far back into hallowed antiquity can we find Solomon? the sorcerer. In this episode, I want to turn to our surviving ground zero for this legendary narrative, the early common era text known simply as the Testament of Solomon. Here we find a fully developed tale where Solomon comes to understand and bind the demonic hordes in the construction of the Jerusalem temple. But also, a text likely more than a mere narrative description. Indeed, the very foundation for the Solomonic school of magic which continues to exist to this day. The Testament of Solomon lies somewhere between narrative legend and practical grimoire, a text as much of a magical manual as a piece of legendary myth. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics and esotericism, including numerous curated playlists. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics and esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon, with a one-time donation via PayPal, or perhaps with the super thanks option you can now find below the video. Again, you can find those links below, and I really do appreciate your consideration, supporting this channel, and making the work of Esoterica widely accessible. But now, let's turn to the foundations of Solomonic magic, his power over the demonic hosts, and the real star of this legend the dozens of demons that Solomon communicates with, binds, and controls. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The notion of Solomon's nearly supernatural wisdom is already to be found in the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, and by the turn of the Common Era, this wisdom had well extended into the domains of magic, especially the control over demons and exorcism more generally. We find this notion already fully developed in the first century Jewish historian Josephus, who actually tells us that he witnessed an exorcism in front of a Roman emperor, no less, in which a ring was used bearing the seal of Solomon. Also among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a fragmentary text bearing an exorcism incantation which invokes the very authority of Solomon. In the centuries that followed, Solomon's power over demonic forces will be found everywhere from the Greek magical papyri produced over in Egypt and as far east as the incantation bowls of Mesopotamia meant to capture and bind spirits before they could enter a house and bother people. This lore would extend and be shared by pagans, Jews, Christians, Mandeans, and Muslim communities all over the ancient world as centuries stretched on and thus cemented Solomon as a mage par excellence. That reputation, of course, would continue through the development of Solomonic magic more generally as the European Middle Ages flourished and would survive and flourish with the rise of Freemasonry in the early modern period 
and the continued popularity of Solomonic magic in contemporary occult practices. But what text can we point to as the locus classicus for this whole genre of Solomonic magic? The answer seems to be a really wonderful text known to history as the Testament of Solomon. The Testament is largely a demonological catalog kind of framed around Solomon's construction of the Jerusalem temple, using said demons produced sometime in the first few centuries of the Common Era. Well, that's the, that's the simple answer, and you know damn well we're not going to get out of this episode without complicating things a good bit more than that, so welcome to complication time. To be honest, virtually nothing can be known with certainty about the origins of the text. It's anonymous, because you're really going to put your name on a book mostly concerned with binding and trolling demons. It was originally composed in a Koine Greek very similar to the New Testament, and very likely composed by an early Christian deeply familiar with and employing pre-Talmudic Jewish demonology most likely in the interest of producing a text bearing on exorcistic and medical practices of the time, as much as there was a difference between exorcism and medicine at that time. It seems most likely the text was produced in Roman Palestine, but the magical technology in the text is actually strikingly similar to Greco-Egyptian magic attested a bit later in the Greek magical papyri. The text, in some form, was probably produced before 400 of the Common Era because it's referenced in the dialogue of Timothy and Aquila produced around that time, though a good deal of the demonology could also be cross-attested in the 3rd century Christian theologian Origen, although that might just be sort of a general Egyptian demonological ferment that both of them rely on. It's apparent, however, that the text has gone through a long and complicated tortured recension history. These days we are pretty spoiled that when I say that, I don't know, I've read The Fall of the House of Usher, I can probably take it for granted that you've read basically the same version as me. Not so much in antiquity. Without the guardrails of antiquity itself, or archaic language, or just the text being in verse, well, text can and do get off the rails in the ancient world. The Testament of Solomon is a complex accretion of Solomonic biography, various non-commiserate demonological catalogs, medical and astrological information, various kinds of magical technologies, all combined over centuries in various degrees of modification and corruption. What perhaps seems most likely is that the text combined legendary Solomonic biography with demonological lore by either a Christian with access to that Jewish lore, or I think just as likely a Jewish Christian with a very specific interest, it seems, in exorcistic medicine sometime in the early centuries of the Common Era. That text was further amplified with more demonological literature, here primarily of an astrological character probably being extracted out of Egypt in origin. More on that Egyptian aspect in just a bit. In a yet later stage, the Testament was increasingly geared in the direction of magical practice. It's being moved away from the world of description into being actionized. In fact, in the final era of the recension of the text, explicitly magical practice is interpolated into the text, and we often just find it bound with other straightforwardly magical manuals in the Byzantine period. That said, the text survives in a little over a dozen Greek manuscripts, of which three major recensions can be tracked. I'll say a bit more about recension C, the most oriented toward practical demonological magic, in just a bit, because I suspect that that recension C is going to be the one that interests most folks watching this channel. The text itself is difficult to summarize because, as I've said, it's basically a demonological catalog framed around Solomon's construction of the Jerusalem Temple, and it's, it's hard to summarize catalogs because catalogs are kind of by their nature already summar summarized. But the text opens with one of Solomon's favorite workers being plagued by a demon. So far, so good. By plagued, I mean the demon is stealing his wages, his food provisions, and sucking his soul out of his thumb while he's sleeping. So, yeah, plagued. Also, thumb here might be a... That's probably a sexual euphemism for reasons we'll get to in a minute. 
For reasons that aren't clear, Solomon really takes a shine to this youth worker and pleads to God to intervene with this whole demon business. Then, lo, God sends the angel Michael to provide Solomon with a ring with a special seal able to bind and control demons. Now, that seal ring we've already seen as far back as Josephus in the first century, but the earliest stratum of the Testament doesn't seem to provide any further information or description on the seal itself, despite the fact that that would be the most conspicuously interesting thing about the, the whole book from at least a magical practice point of view. But, as I mentioned, the text does end up on a very practical magical trajectory and various manuscripts provide various versions of this Solomonic seal. In fact, there seem to be as many versions of this seal as there are manuscripts, or at least manuscript traditions. The most common motifs for the seal are magical terms or magical words, sometimes in Hebrew set into circles, very often displaying a pentagram or a hexagram along with further magical symbols. Though by the early modern period and the development of the Lesser Key of Solomon, probably the most popular version of the Solomonic magic at least these days, the seal has undergone dramatic transformation. None of that hardly can be found in the Lesser Key of Solomon seal. You can compare the one on the screen from Harley MS5596, a 15th century magical manual including various recensions of the testament, along with a host of other magical literature, it's actually a really amazing manuscript, to the more popular Lesser Key of Solomon version to get a sense of just how much variation one can find in these manuscripts about what exactly was the Seal of Solomon. So, which one is more accurate or has the most magical power? I don't know, it beats the hell out of me. But, I don't think you can get the Testament version on Etsy, so if you want to be like a hipster mage and be like, Oh, the Lesser Key Seal? I use the MS Harley 5596. It's kind of kind of underground. Maybe you want to listen to my cool black metal track. I'm only releasing it on four-minute Edison wax cylinders. Like six of them. Well, whatever seal you want to use, Shlomo Melech, as we call him, gives the ring to the youth who, when the demon comes to suck his thumb, creepy. He casts the ring, Pokemon style, into his chest, immediately binding the demon. Dragged before Solomon, the demon, like the veritable parade of demons to come, is forced to reveal their name, their astrological location in the cosmos, their activities, because demons are usually up to no good, especially the specific harms they inflict upon mankind, their genealogy, which I think is a really fascinating aspect of the demon demonological lore here. Beelzebul, for instance, is the last OG angel that fell to earth in the descent to earth by the original angels, while other ones like Asmodeus actually have angelic fathers but human mothers, kind of Nephilim style, along with their corresponding thwarting angel before being sentenced to various forms of hard labor in the construction of the temple. It's kind of like a demonic gulag over there. In fact, this whole demonological system has a D&D &D monster manual feel to it, to be honest. All they need is like an armor class and hit die and we're ready to roll for initiative, folks. Though really, the testament would actually benefit strongly for someone creating like a spreadsheet with all the charts of all the demons and their activity and their stats and their activities and their binding angels and their thacos. You have it all laid out, just, just an idea. If someone actually makes a Testament of Solomon spreadsheet with all the information we have about these demons. I'll link it in the description, just saying, make it a banger of one. In this case, though, the demon captured is Ornias, his name literally means vexing, who dwells in Aquarius and is a pedophile demon who strangles male Aquarians attracted to Virgo women, who can also appear variously as a winged being or a lion. That thumb thing is getting even weirder. Ornias is said to have descended from a fallen archangel and is thwarted by the archangel Uriel. As punishment for attacking this young boy, or young man, Solomon sentences him to hard labor, cutting stones for the production of the temple. Though Ornias, like many demons, is terrified of iron. This is something repeated in Michael Sellis' Demonological Manual, which you can check out in the card above. That's why you often see necromancers with swords. There's something terrifying about them, and we'll talk about that in Michael Sellis. 
Given this fear of iron, Ornias offers to give up his other fellow demons, kind of snitch. Undeterred, Solomon has Uriel summon sea monsters and cast the fate of Ornias on the ground. This section is as awesome as it is unclear, but now Solomon gets to have his cake and eat it too. Ornias is forced to labor unto the completion of the temple, and he's forced to bring forth the prince of the demons, Beelzebul. Once the prince of the demons is bound, same throwing the ring into his chest business, the entire demonic retinue is brought before Solomon. Each one of them is bound and forced to reveal again their name, astrological information, their demonic shenanigans, before being sentenced to hard labor in the construction of the temple. Everything from cutting stones to spinning rope to carrying water. Though it, it's always struck me that these menial tasks seem like a waste of dem demonic potential for them to do other stuff. Though this whole demons building the temple narrative should be contrasted, by the way, with another legendary cycle found in the Babylonian Talmud, where Solomon used various kinds of demons, specifically Asmodeus, to find a magical worm. Yep, a magical worm called the Shamir to help build the temple. You can learn more about that specific version of the narrative around the building of the temple using demons in my episode on the Lesser Key of Solomon in the card above. No doubt the most popular, is that the right word? Most popular grimoire or book of magic in the Solomonic cycle, especially in contemporary times. I mean, Goetic demons are getting their own animes and movie deals, and I'm still looking to get coffee with Paimon's agent because I'm going to break into Hollywood. Hey, Paimon, if you're watching this, each demonic narrative is fascinating and serves to display the wide range of demonological lore accessible to the redactors of this text. We have the usual cast of characters such as Asmodeus and Beelzebul. The demoness Lilith makes an appearance, though she's actually known in this text as Obizut, which is interesting. Lesser known demons include a satira-like character called Onoskelis, the wind demon with the more Latinate name Lix Tatrax, a Pazuzu-like wind demon named Ephippus, a winged dragon, and the dread seahorse demon, seahorse demon Kunopegos, along with the two-headed female lunar demoness called Enepsigos, along with a bunch of others. Further, the text has a Gnostic-ish, Gnostic-ish? Gnostic-like interlude where the seven planets seem to be denoted as demonic rulers of this realm known as deception, strife, fate, distress, error, power, and the last one's called the worst. The worst. This very interestingly parallels on the origin of the world in the Nag Hammadi library where death is produced by Yaldabaoth, you know, the Demiurge, and set to control the sixth heaven. Their death, being androgyne, produces seven sons and seven daughters, and through incest, they go on to produce a host of many, many other beings. Those original seven sons and daughters of death are very similar to the ones found in the Testament. Now, while the lists don't really overlap with the Testament, they only really share eris or strife, the Gnostic texts conclude by telling the reader that the demonic names and functions of all those various beings created through incest with the death kids can be found in a Book of Solomon. Now, I'm skeptical it's the testament as we have it, but I do strongly suspect that this is a case of survival bias where many other testament-like Solomonic literature existed. While not a strong match, it's still strikingly conspicuous nonetheless. Speaking of Nagamadi in Egypt, the text also contains a detailed list of 36 demons which correspond to the deacons of the Zodiac. This astrological distinction seems very likely Egyptian in origin, not Palestinian, and the demonological catalog is especially important in the transition toward the text becoming a practical manual and virtually all of these demons seem especially connected to disease. It seems like this zodiac part was included in part of the trajectory of making this text practical, not just narrative. And again, it's worth pointing out just how demonically populated the cosmos is in the Testament. From the circle of the zodiac to the planets themselves, the various stars and the wilder places of the earth, the world seems simply full of demons. It's a 
veritable pandemonium. Well, following the astrological demons, we learn that the demons know the future because they can fly up close to the throne of God before becoming exhausted and plunging back to the earth as falling stars. Meanwhile, back at the construction site of the temple, things have hit a snag. Neither men nor demons can set the enormous cornerstone of the temple into place. At the same time, Solomon receives a distress letter from the king of Arabia asking him to remove the very powerful wind demon Ephippus. Solomon sends his envoy and they trap the demon Ephippus in a leather flask. Then the demon trap now agrees to work with the demon of the Red Sea, Ebezet, the boo, Ebezet, to place a corner, the cornerstone of the temple. The cornerstone then placed, it appears that the demon of the Red Sea, who has also raised a gigantic pillar out of the Red Sea, is bound to hold it in the sky forever. This is probably the origins of the Milky Way, at least in the text. For what it's worth, by the way, Abizethi Bu is the demon who the Egyptian magicians Yannis and Yambris employed when they magically dueled with Moses and Aaron, who also hardened Pharaoh's heart, somehow getting God off the deal for that. And they went on to chase the Israelites with the Egyptian army until they were swallowed up by the Red Sea when it collapsed and on top of them along with all those poor Egyptians. The Testament of Solomon ends with the downfall of Solomon. With the construction of the temple complete, Solomon can return to his true love, the gathering of wisdom. Nah, it's not, it's philandering. And in order to obtain some Shumanite booty, Solomon sacrifices five locusts to the pagan gods Raphan and Molach. And the spirit of God, well, it departs from him and he places idols into the temple that he spent all that time with all those demons building. Solomon tells us how he's composed the testament for his fellow Israelites so that the demonological lore wouldn't be lost. In fact, later legends have the book being hidden by Hezekiah and surviving down to this day. Of course, the text itself, why fundamentally a book of pre-Talmudic Jewish demonology, is at this point thoroughly Christian. Many of the adjurations and exorcistic language of the text emerge directly out of the New Testament, and many of the demons can only be fully bound by a future power, interestingly depicted as a kind of angel who will be executed and rise from the dead. Yeah, this text kind of depicts Jesus as like a powerful angel, and some of the magical binding incantations seem to be taken directly from the mouth of the dying Jesus. One version of this is a incantation called Elohi, which is probably Jesus' last words. Thus, the text is also a kind of Christian prophetic wisdom, such that while Solomon can bind some of the demons some of the time, he eventually falls into a life of lust-driven idolatry. It would be Jesus who would fully bind all of the demons, defeat death itself, and remain divinely pure. Though, as I pointed out, the Testament of Solomon is a text somewhere between being a mere story of Solomon's adventures with the demons, D and D adventure, a demonological catalog, and a manual for demonological magic. Clearly, the text fires the imagination in all those directions, but is certain the mere tales of Solomonic magic inspired more and more practically oriented magical texts to be produced, even internal to the testament itself. Thus, in recension C, the language has become much more imperative and hypothetical. It's much more of a straightforward manual of demonic magic. In fact, in the center of this recension, there is a detailed demonological list very much aimed at something like the practice of goetic magic with over 50 different demons, their seals, and various skills. It's sort of like a proto-Goetia or a proto-Lesser Key of Solomon. In fact, Recension C is something like the bridge which connects the more descriptive, legend-like testament to the more Solomonic magical literature often bound with it, especially the Greek Hygromantea or the Magical Treatise of Solomon. That text, in turn, will serve as the foundation as for all of Solomonic magical practice as it develops in Western Europe down to this day. Of course, I'll be coming back to the Hygromantia or the Magical Treatise of Solomon in a future episode, so 
stay tuned for that one. The Testament of Solomon is just required reading for anyone interested in ritual and Solomonic magic, the history of demonology, or just anyone interested in the lore around Solomon like our Freemason brothers out there. It's a fantastic piece of very ancient legend and magical practice, especially seeing how those legends and practices developed over the centuries and the millennia. This text is almost 2,000 years old. And you might be surprised to learn that the standard critical edition of the text by McCowan was produced in 1922, making it a century old this year. So, happy centennial Testament of Solomon critical edition. That text is wonderful, but of course it's rather dated at this point. Though, if you want to see the various recensions in the original Greek language, it's still basically going to be your go-to. For the standard introduction and diplomatic translation, however, you're going to want to check out Dueling's edition in Volume 1 of the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. In fact, you just want both volumes of that text if you're interested in esoteric stuff like this. Even without the Greek, it has tons of useful notes and brings in discoveries like Nagamati made decades after McGowan produced this edition. Also, for those interested in the more magically oriented recension C of the Testament, i.e. everyone watching this channel, you'll need to pick up a copy of Brian Johnson's edition of Recension C. You may recall Brian from my episode on the Necromancy Manual from the Medici Library. He's a great scholar and produces really cool texts. His edition is especially important for those interested in the very specific magical development of the Solomonic tradition. Of course, you'll need the rest of the Testament of Solomon and the Dueling Edition to really make sense of how all the recensions fit together, including Recension C, but I'm sure you're going to want Recension C as well. Don't worry, much more Solomonic material coming, so stay tuned. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.